Good morning. Welcome back to Chop for Time. I'm Devin. I'm back now. Um, thankful for Britt for joining us, and I'm joined by Ben and Thomas. We're going to start off with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for blessing us this morning. We thank you for the weather outside. Um, we thank you, Lord God, for your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, what you've done for us and what you are doing for us, that you are involved in our lives. We ask, Lord God, that you would just bless this time as we share, that it would encourage our hearts and it would encourage those hearts of those who listen or watch. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And uh, just what a blessing it was yesterday to come back. I've uh, been in Africa for a couple weeks here, uh, missed some of the messages, but came right back into just a blessing of you talking about God's grace and how he's interacting in lives, how he's chosen to, to make it purposeful and to get involved in people's lives. Would you uh, give our viewers or listeners a recap of what you shared yesterday? John 4, uh, purposeful, relational, and superior, uh, covered the Portion, at least a portion of Jesus's interaction with the woman at the well. Uh, you know, John 1, 14 uh, tells us, as John is providing us these descriptors, that uh, the word is full of grace and truth. Yes. Then in verse 16 in chapter 1, it talks about because of this gift of God, this fullness of the Messiah, the word that we experience grace on top of grace. Mm. And we really highlighted that in chapter four, because we built, you know, there's, there's a little bit, bit of a natural bridge that needs to take place from the conversation in chapter three, where Jesus talks with Nicodemus at night into the conversation and the encounter with the woman at the well. Now we have John the, and another account of John the Baptist in between there to finish out chapter three, but that's kind of what I wanted to do was provide a little bit of a bridge between those two conversations and to answer some questions is what what was present, what was common in both conversations. And really Jesus's grace in his purpose of coming um, was that's what he was explaining verbally to Nicodemus in a lot of ways. But then we really began to see it playing out in his actions in John chapter four. So relation, you know, purposeful, relational and superior grace is what we broke that passage down into. You know, verse 4, the uh, purposeful grace that we see where it says that he had to go through Samaria uh, when he didn't physically have to. There were other routes, but because Jesus came to tear down walls mm -hmm. uh, that restricted people from getting to him instead of building them up or reinforcing them, right. um, he had to go through Samaria. So it was a purposeful uh, time of travel for Jesus. It was a purposeful location. It wasn't just the shortest route or the quickest route or the easiest route. Uh, then we get into the relational aspect of it. Verses 6 through 8 begins to uh, really unfold for us there this the meaning of the encounter that he had with the woman at the well. Uh, again, tearing down just brick by brick these walls of restriction for certain people and people groups to be able to approach God, mm -hmm. you know, to experience God. And then at the end, verses 10 through 14, it's a superior grace. And that's when he begins to talk about the living water, you know, this water that I offer you. Uh, and then took five keys you know, to what the differences between the water um, that he was referring to as to the water that she was referencing out of Jacob's well yes. at that time. Well, it sure was powerful. I really enjoyed the message. And I, I think there was a couple things that stand out to me, but I like that it was purposeful. You know, that it's not standard, not hap happen. You know, I mean, I think the King James says, must needs go through mm -hmm. Mary, you know, and but um it just just that he had a plan of action to go and save a people who were considered outcast. Mm -hmm. And I loved how you broke that down. But the other one that even stands out more than that, I, I love that because he gets involved in people's lives. 
he gets involved. He stands at the door and knocks at every person's heart, mm-hmm. and he's knocking. He's involved in their lives, whether they see it or not, hear it or not. He's still there. So the other one that stood out to me was his grace is superior. I really love that. You know, and I love that when he, we were talking, it wasn't an ego thing. It was something that he was saying. You know, I'm the answer. I'm the solution here to your problem. And and the last part is the satisfaction. You know, we mm-hmm. talked about that right there. You know. We are looking for satisfaction in life, and we will pursue it to the ends of the earth. You know, some of us find it in a family, some find it in their job, some find it in games, drugs, whatever things that you talked yeah. about yesterday. And it was so awesome because, you know, that is, even as Christians, you know, sometimes we just want to sprinkle a little Jesus on our life right there, you know, his satisfaction. We'll put him on top of our satisfaction, you know, mm-hmm. just like, yeah, that will have some extra flavor to our life. And that's not what God's looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, he wants us to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness, hungering and thirsting for him. And it just made me again realize how much more I need Jesus. Yeah. You know, how much more I need to be satisfied with him and him alone. And when he is there, it's eternal life. And I think you broke into all those five different aspects right there. But that really stood out to me. I was, I was so thankful because that's what I need to hear all the time. Not just one time, not just, you know, I need to realize, man, because every day the devil's tempting us out there to, hey, just get a little bit of this or get a little bit of that, you know, and it's like, oh, man, you know, and sometimes we'll reach out for it, sure, we fall all the time, but just realize again, man, Jesus, 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 that's what stood out to me. What about you, Sophra? Um, Yeah, so, like, the, uh, yeah, I I love the story of the woman at the well, and, you know, one of the things I think you'd you'd brought up a little bit was even just the, the nature of her being this, social outcast or this the, the, there was this prejudice between these communities and and that all of these sort of barriers weren't uh weren't barriers to jesus they might have been bar- barriers to the pharisees or right, to yes. to the others but jesus broke down those walls and, and pushed through and and met her regardless of her social status her you know all that kind of stuff um and it's not that jesus only went for those people you know like like you said he just finished talking to nicodemus who's probably a relatively prominent person in the complete other camp, mm. you know, um, but, G- you know, Jesus went out of his way to to kind of flip the tables on who's deserving of what, if that makes sense, you know, and, and we, we see that, in, I think, with Matthew 19 and Matthew 20 have, you know, the story of, um, or the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, and it's kind of bookended by this statement of the first will be last and the last will be first, mm-hmm. you know, Jesus sort of takes our social constructs and just flips them on their heads, you know, yeah. um, which is always refreshing because for 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 those of us in, you know, we're in a part of the world where we have everything that we need and, you know, we're pretty high up in the social status of, of well, globally, if you look at it that way, um, you know, that's humbling to us or for those who are at the bottom of the food chain, that should be encouraging to them and, and there's purpose in, in all of that to help remind us where we're at, you know, um, and that God's grace is for everybody. It's indiscriminate. It's, you know, it's purposeful to reach everybody. And I think that was just a a big encouragement for me. Yeah. And that's, you know, at the, kind of at the beginning of the message, we did a little bit of a, uh, what, what are the, the differences here? Again, building that bridge between Nicodemus and the woman at the well, we, we have to understand that I don't know if there could have been a, a greater example of polar opposites Mm -hmm. than what we see i mean even from the conditions the time you know nicodemus coming he came to jesus at night Mm -hmm. jesus goes to the woman at the well and you know he nicodemus was at the darkest of night jesus went to the woman at the well in the height of the day yes um and and we we see this social stature like you were talking about like nicodemus would have been at least part of the standard of the Jewish culture. Like, he's he's one of the guys that we look to that the way he lives, the way he does things, that is the standard that we need to try to live up to uh, because he's living by all of the, the traditions, the laws, the regulations, all the statutes and, you know, everything that the Jewish faith leaders not only held themselves to, but then... You know, so graciously decided everybody else needs to live by these as well. He would have been someone that they would have looked to as being up here as far as standard wise. Completely the opposite for the woman at the well, this lady from Samaria, who, again, Samaritans were considered half breeds. 
by the Jews. I mean, less than human, if we're being honest. They, they looked at them as a lesser, um, lesser creation. Like they believed that they themselves were made more in the image of God and the likeness of God right. than what the Samaritans were. So we just we have such polar opposite accounts, which just goes to show that you know Jesus is um, he's not a respecter of persons from the standpoint of like Jew, Gentile, lost, saved, righteous, unrighteous, what whatever labels we want to clean, unclean. Uh, it it doesn't matter to Jesus. He came for everyone. Mm. Uh, and again, I don't know if we really value and, and understand the depths of just how different these two people were. Amen. So um, we talked a little bit earlier, and you said that you had a concept that didn't quite make it into your message, that you would spring us on the spot, which is, this is not on the spot, but hey, we love all those on the spot stuff anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so much, again, in John chapter four, and even so much in the account of the woman at the well, the, the way that she went, you know, the, the disciples' reaction when they came back, uh, details of her reaction in the middle of it when she went, uh, you know, and Jesus is like, hey, let's keep this on the down low here. And then she went and told everyone, you know, about this man that she had just encountered. Uh, so there's so much of stuff that was actually chopped for time that we just couldn't get into. But there, there was one that kind of stood out to me through the week um, that as I was – you know, preparing for this message and studying for it, one of the themes that you'll see that a lot of preachers preach on out of this passage is the example of Jesus's evangelism mm. in this passage. And it's not wrong. Mm. All right. So let me say that up front. It is, it is not wrong to take this passage and go, Jesus gives us a really good blueprint for evangelism in the life of a believer. Sure. Um, but when I got to reading a little bit deeper into that, uh, you know, one of one of Thomas's lessons that he teaches frequently uh, with the youth, one of the things that we talk about some here uh, with our adults is the fact of the Bible is not a book about heroes of the faith. It's a book about the hero hmm. of mankind. Yes. So like when we look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Paul, Peter, insert any biblical character here, it, they're not the hero of the story. Mm. They're, they're just not. They're fault, flawed, fallible people just like you and I who mm. did wretched, deplorable things in their lives. But Jesus is the hero of the entirety of Scripture. And I think sometimes when we're preaching messages on evangelism and Looking at this passage in particular, one of the themes that I continually saw over and over and over again in messages and writings and blogs and commentaries and stuff is like, be like Jesus in this passage. Mm. And the thought crossed my mind as I was reading the entirety of this story again. I was like, we're not Jesus. In this story, we're not Jesus. Kind of go by Matt Chandler, you're not David. You know, it's like we're not the, the role in this story. We're not Jesus. Yes. Now, it's never wrong to try to be like Jesus. He came to give us a perfect right. example. I'm not disputing that whatsoever. But in light of the context of this passage in this John chapter four, we are not Jesus. Right. We are the woman at the well. If we want to take ourselves and try to place ourselves into this story mm. anywhere, we're the woman at the well. Amen. And I look at Nicodemus and with the woman at the well. What are what are the things that they responded with so quickly? Nicodemus, number one, when Jesus said, you must be born again, you know, this new birth, Nicodemus's mind went to the first thing was the impossibility of that. Mm. It's like, what's missing in this equation? And Nicodemus' answer was, how am I, as a grown man, supposed to re-enter my mother's womb and be born again? So he immediately went to what's missing here, mm. or what's wrong, or what's the impossibility. In John chapter 4, the woman at the well, what was her response when Jesus said, you know, give me a drink, I need a drink? Her immediate response to that request was, but you don't have a vessel. You don't have a container. 
what are you going to drink from? Her response was, what was missing? Hmm. Nicodemus's was like, what was the impossibility? Hers was what was missing from the solution. And isn't that just the same with you and I in a lot of ways? Like when we look at the the things that God's doing in our lives or the things that he commands us to do, the way that he works, isn't our first primary response most of the time of like the same thing with Moses? It's like, well, I don't, I can't talk nothing good. Yeah. You know, it's like, here's Mm -hmm. my deficiency. Here's the problem. And I think I kind of like to take a few minutes for us to talk about our perception sometimes of scripture and our role as we're reading it. Because while Jesus provides a fantastic blueprint for evangelism, I think that we need to be readily understanding that we are the woman at the well in this passage. And again, the key takeaway is that the Bible provides us woeful news about ourselves, not to beat us down, but to magnify the grace and salvation of God even more and to be as wonderful as it really is. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to get your all's thoughts on that, this concept of when we read these passages, especially at the woman at the well, if we're in the story, we're the woman at the well. Mm-hmm. Um. Wow, you know, so I think that's great. We all should, I like to identify with the people in the passage, you know, I, mm-hmm. asking questions is important too, you know, I mean, why is this important? What's he saying there? You know, what is, because when you look at Jesus, he's, one of the things that I, I look at is that Jesus is not just placating people. He's not just saying, uh, you know, he doesn't come in with the same verbiage every time. Do you know Jesus? You know, we'll often ask that people, hey, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? You know, sometimes that he's looking right to the need mm-hmm. and he uses whatever's around him. You know, it's so awesome. You know, just... He's so using, whether it's the wind, you don't know, understand the wind, how can I teach you about this, or the water. You know I mean? He's just using whatever's there just because everything points back to him. And I think identifying with the woman at the well is chief. You know, just earlier, you know, obviously there's great aspects of talking about ministering to people just yeah. as I was just sharing. Yeah. But, you know, if we're looking at this, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what am I, that's why it stood out to me earlier what am I seeking my significance in? One of your key points yesterday or, you know, three mm-hmm. points that you mentioned. And, you know, why is that important? Because even as a Christian, I'm seeking significance in things other than Christ at times. And so, I, you know, how is Jesus speaking to me? Are you going back? You said it yesterday. Sometimes I do. Yeah. I just go back again and again and again and never get filled. And all of a sudden I'm like, man, this is not working. I'm not being satisfied here it's because I'm not seeking Jesus. And so I think that's important that we look both aspects. You know, it's always good to look at, you know, can you speak to people like Jesus does? Or, you know, what would Jesus say if I was the woman coming to the well and I'm broken? Realizing, too, is that I'm always broken. Mm-hmm. Those who are a well have no need of a physician. Yep. So once I say, hey, I'm good now, <laughs> Jesus is like, you're cool. I don't, You don't have anything. He no longer can give anything to me because I'm good. Yeah. Those who are well have no need of a physician. That's what he would tell the Pharisees all the time. You think you're good? I can't give anything to you. And you know, that's so important that I say to myself, I'm still broken. Yeah. I'm still in need of Jesus' grace and mercy and his insight. And whatever he's offering me, I want some of it. So, you know, yes, I'm going to take some of that. I'm not have to argue. Him. But I like the other point I'm going to just, and then I'll, I'll break it over, is how both Nicodemus, since you brought him up, and the woman at the well answer from their own religious perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, each one talks about their, they're into the point of, you know, how can this be? Or, you know, what are you talking about? They bring in their own, you know, standards. The woman, you say you worship, we worship over here. You know, I'm going to get really religious on you. It happens so often. And it's how we get sometimes with the Lord too. We try to answer him out of our own mind and set, you know, we're like, oh, but, you know, we try to reason it out and figure out. And he just says, man, just accept what I'm saying. Take what I'm giving you and run with it. And that's when we can get to that point. I want myself hopefully to be at that point someday. We're like, yes, I'm going to grab onto what you're saying. I don't need to ask a bunch of questions because, mm-hmm. man, I've done this before. Just need to get hold of you, Jesus. Thank you so much. So that kind of what stands out to me in that okay. one. Me? Yeah, I, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that was kind of where I was thinking of going as well. Is this the 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 part of her response or I mean, kind of her deflection, right? Because mm-hmm. this is straight after. Jesus says, like, 
yeah, you don't have a husband, but you are living with a guy who wasn't one of your previous five husbands, you know, and kind of calls her out a little bit, which is a, a common theme with Jesus as well. Like he never just doesn't address the sin problem, mm-hmm. you know, he, you know, he, he blends the two and, and her response is, well, I see you're a prophet, so why don't you answer me this theological question, yes. you know? And I think like that can be something that I find myself falling into a lot is like chasing the knowledge about Jesus as opposed to Jesus himself. Yes. You know, we can be, we, we get a whole bunch of different types of people in here that work with us, you know, through the college, you know, with different theological frameworks and different belief systems that, you know, intern with us and, and stuff. And it can be really easy to just get sucked into these theological conversations, of, you know, of reformed theology versus this other type of thing where, you know, and, and we spend weeks talking about theology without mentioning Jesus. Do you know what I mean? And, and we can, we can almost distract ourselves, um, uh, and forget that the whole point was Jesus, you know, Jesus kind of answers her question of like, where are we supposed to worship? And he's like, doesn't matter because <laughs> there, there will come a day and that time's actually now that, it, you know, you'll worship in, in spirit and in truth. And, you know, and we, we get so wrapped up in all of these other little things, not that they're not important, but once they start replacing, um, the, the, the main character, the hero of the story, then, then we've, we've missed something big. And I think, I think it's, I think part of the reason that I can, I can get sucked into the, the distraction of knowledge, right. Over Jesus, you know, knowing more about Jesus as opposed to knowing Jesus is I think deep down, there's a little bit in our heads that are like, I like to know that I'm right about something Oh yeah. as opposed to seeking the one who's right, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and but you know, which is just a, a humbling thing. And the thing with both with both people, that's a very, like you said, a very similar case of like they're they're trying to figure it out because they want, you know, uh, maybe they don't. But there's there's an aspect of they want to be right. You know, you want to know the things. You want to have a good little debate, or you want to figure things out. And Jesus is like just just follow me. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One, I think that you know one of the things you touched on there is Jesus. You know, this is it's a pride issue. When it comes yeah. down to it, Nicodemus had his ways, his thoughts, and his interpretations of what was right. And then when those were challenged, and any time that we have that happen to us, too, our pride is challenged yes. a little bit. The woman at the well. I mean, even ha- how um, incredibly broken she would have probably been from the state of her life, period. She still had that resistance, and she did. She deflected, like, big time in this passage. Almost every Jesus's mm-hmm. point, she had a deflection counterpoint type thing. <laughs> yes. She was struggling with, well, this concept has been right to me my whole life. Um, and then I think the the third element of this passage that we've not even talked about yet is uh, is the disciples. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the the way, because guess what? Not only are we the woman at the well, but we're also the disciples in this passage whenever they return to, and they're just like, hey, what what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Um, And when I read that, I was like, I never really realized how many parallels and how similar this story is to the parable of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, the we're not the father in that story. We're most definitely the prodigal son. But then we're also the older brother. Mm -hmm. And we see that kind of in the disciples also whenever they come back to this story. It's like, what, her? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Do you not realize that this is absolutely going to wreck your reputation? Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think it's it's fascinating with those different facets. So that yeah, that, that's kind of what I wanted to present to you guys is this. So often we are guilty of reading the Bible through very self-centered lenses mm-hmm. and trying to make it about us mm-hmm. when Scripture is not about us. It's about Jesus. Amen. Now, Jesus was about us. And that's why he came. Mm-hmm. But we can't read scripture through the lens of self, self-absorption. self It'll lead you to the wrong conclusion every time. Yep. yep. Make it all about you because Jesus has calls us to make it not about us. Yep. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And I think the disciples, he was always teaching them, it's not about you. You know, hey, you bring me some food. I got food to eat, which you do not know. And, you know life's about this it's not about you you know so it's you think you're meeting your needs but 
hey, if you just depend upon God and me, you, you'll be filled up. You know, so that's what it. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Um, is there anything, final words, any final words? I think, I think I'm good. If you guys are. I'm good. I've said, I've said enough. Awesome. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. If you uh, haven't, uh, we had asked that you'd hit that like button, that subscribe button, and uh, that would get it out to even more people that uh, would need to hear this message or would like to hear this message. If you would like to contact us, we could be reached at fccgrayson.com, or you can give us a call. We would love to hear from you, and uh, we'd love to see you. If you don't have a home church, we invite you to come participate with us. We're going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With that, let's uh, let's close out in a word of prayer. Thomas, would you close out? Certainly. Father, thank you for another opportunity to uh, discuss your word. Um, Lord, I pray that you um, inspire each of us through these stories, the Nicodemus story, the story with uh, the woman at the well, and the story with the disciples and their response, Lord, that to, to analyze where we're at uh, and what our focus is, um, if we're being distracted by all the other things or if our focus is you. Lord, we thank you for the Gospel of John, and we're excited to see uh, just where it develops and where we go with this study. Uh, we ask a listen to your name. Amen. Amen.